Good looking bunch of kids. Yes. See, I can do better than that. All right. Well, we're in the book of James here for a series. Maybe you've noticed. And uh, last week, <laughs> last week I spoke to you about how to profit from your problems. Because that's one of the first things that it mentions to us in the book of James. We're going to continue this week. We're still in the first chapter of James. And we're going to continue this week with wisdom. Wisdom. We all need it. You know. We can all look back on times when we wish we had had more of it. Yeah. Or on times when <laughs> we had used what we had. Real faith that really works in the real world. Which is where most of you live, right? You live in the real world. Well, evidently not everybody, but still, that's where we live. So I heard this story. A young man calls his dad announcing that he has met the woman of his dreams. What should he do? Well, his dad suggests to him, why don't you send her some flowers? And on the card, invite her to your place for a home-cooked meal. He thought this was a great idea. A week later, Dad called to find out how it went. The son said, it was a disaster. A disaster. Well, didn't she come over? Oh, she came over, but she refused to cook. <laughs> it says in James chapter 1, verse 5, actually verses 5 through 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded wind, double-minded wind, double-minded man, unstable in all he does. James 1, 5 through 8. Now, I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that the greatest need that dads have as they guide their family is wisdom. We need wisdom. The problem is that James makes it quite clear it is also the thing we most lack. What do you think, dads? You think that's true? Yeah? No, I didn't ask you women. It's the thing that we most lack. Here's the problem. If any of you lacks wisdom, life continually calls for wisdom. It's a series of choices that we make every day. 
a man named Frank Barnum said this. He said, we make our decisions and then our decisions make us. And that's true. Let me, uh, let me, let me read you this kind of fable, okay? About the guy who couldn't make up his mind. Did I ever tell you about the young Zod who came to two signs in the fork of the road? He looked one way and the other way too. The Zod had to make up his mind what to do. Well, the Zod scratched his head and his chin and his pants and he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance if I go to place one, that place may be hot. So how will I know if I like it or not? On the other hand, though, I'll feel such a fool if I go to place two and find it too cool. In that case, I may catch a chill and turn blue. So place one may be best and not place two. On the other hand, though, if place one is too high, I might get a terrible earache and die. You still with me here, folks? Very profound stuff here. <laughs> On the other hand, though, if place two is too low, I might get some terrible pain in my toe. So place one may be best, and he started to go, then he stopped and he said, on the other hand, though, Forty-six hours and one-half that zod made starts and stops at the fork in the road. Well, saying, no, don't take a chance, it may not be right, then he got an idea that was wonderfully bright. Play safe, cried the zod. I'll play safe, I'm no dunce. I'll simply start off to both places at once. And that's how the Zod, who would not take a chance, went no place at all with a split in his pants. <laughs> Told you it was profound. Zod needed wisdom, wisdom. The literal definition of the word for wisdom in Greek, Sophia, is enlightenment, a source of light beyond ourselves. Enlightenment. How do we get wisdom? Fortunately, we are given a prescription. The prescription is found in the last part of the fifth verse of that first chapter of James. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. That's who you should ask. If you contrast the doubting, debilitated Zod with the wisdom that God gives, you discover that it brings things. It will bring personal protection. Do not forsake wisdom, it says in Proverbs, and she will protect you. It will give you personal power, this wisdom will. A wise man has great power, more from Proverbs. It will give you, yeah, personal prosperity. We've just been talking about Financial Peace University. One of the things that you learn in Financial Peace University is you learn how wisdom brings you prosperity says in Proverbs, with me, wisdom is speaking here. He says in Proverbs, with me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. Wow. The next verses in our passage from James continue to outline God's part and God's plan. So let's start looking at God's part. This is the promise that we have. Okay. If any of you, this is the promise, 
If any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Mm -hmm. The provider of the promise is God. And there are some characteristics about God that we need to understand. It'll help you. In the first place, the provider of this promise is the giving God. God who gives. It says in that fifth verse, to didontes theon, literally translated the giving God. If I were you, I would just stick with the giving God. The Greek rarely helps. <laughs> this is a fundamental trait of God. He loves to give. By his very nature, God is a giver. He loves it. This is his character. A man named Alexander McLaren. He said this, he said, just as the sun cannot but pour out its rays, so the very activity of the divine nature, the very thing that God is like, is self-impartation. In other words, imparting of himself. And his joy is to grant himself to his creatures. That's what God wants to do. Grant himself to his creatures, to you and me. He's a giving God. He's also a generous God. Generous. God who gives generously. God not only gives, but he gives generously. He gives liberally. He pours it out there. When you ask for wisdom from the giving God, you can be absolutely certain you will receive it in abundance. Number three this characteristics of God, this giving God. He's a gracious God. He gives generously to all. He's a gracious God. He's a gentle God. God who gives generously to all without finding fault. You know, sometimes if you were to ask a help from a friend, then you feel responsible to straighten, the friend feels responsible to straighten you out. You ever notice that? Probably don't keep such friends very long, but nonetheless. Nonetheless. And uh, you know, the first, when they find out what you've done and why you have this need, their first is to say, well, what were you thinking? What's the matter with you? You know, most of us, don't need a lecture. We need help, not advice. Never once have I gone to God with a problem and been beaten down by his response to me. He offers his hand of help and wisdom. Oh, I have another one of these. See? You may have heard of the man who fell in the pit you heard about this guy? Some of you aren't sure. He fell into a pit and he couldn't get out. So a subjective person came along and said to him, I fear for you down there in your pit. <laughs> Helpful. A judgmental person came along and said, you know, only bad people fall into pits. You deserve to be in the pit. An engineer came along and calculated how you fell into the pit. A news reporter wanted the exclusive story on your life in the pit. The IRS agent wanted to know if you were paying taxes on the pit. A self-centered person said, your pit is nothing compared to my pit. A psychologist said, your family, your family upbringing is to blame for your pit. Self-esteemed therapists, we only have those in California. Self-esteemed therapist said, believe in yourself 
and you will get out of your pit. Optimists said things could get worse. The pessimists claimed things will get worse. And Jesus comes along and seeing the man in the pit took him by the hand and lifted him out. That's the difference between the world's advice and Jesus' action. There are some prerequisites to all of this. There's our part. The prerequisites of the promises are, number one, we have to admit it. We have to admit it. If any of you lacks wisdom, it says, A father and a son are in the church basement. They're all alone down there. And the son is wearing a tuxedo. He's reminiscing. He says to his father, Dad, when I broke my leg my first time skiing, you were there. When I fumbled the ball and lost the game for my team, you were there. When I totaled a family car, you were there. And now my fiancé called off our wedding, and you're here. Dad, you're bad luck. <laughs> it's pretty hard for some people to admit they need help. And that's just possibly because I lack wisdom. If we want all the benefits of wisdom, it begins with our admitting that we don't have it. See. The key to becoming wise is to admitting, I don't know, Lord. I need your guidance on this. Start with yourself and admit your need of God's guidance. So you start out by admitting it. And you move on then, as it tells us in the scripture, to asking, asking for it. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Wisdom cannot be achieved. Wisdom is received. You receive it from him. Proverbs reminds us, says, for the Lord gives wisdom. The Lord does. The scripture makes it abundantly clear that we are just to ask. In James 4, 2, the scripture says, you have not because you ask not. Twenty times in the New Testament, the Lord promises us, ask and it shall be given. Twenty times in the New Testament. I'll tell you the truth. You would expect me to. Many times before I pick up the phone, I stop and ask the Lord, give me some wisdom for this situation, this circumstance. Help me to know what to say. Help me to know what to do. Sometimes I'll ask the Lord for wisdom two dozen times in one day, just continually. In a difficult con conversation with someone, I'll ask the Lord for wisdom over and over before each response. Because I don't know what the answer should be. We should anticipate it. Anticipate it. Ask for it. Anticipate it. Because it tells us in James 1.5, that fifth verse has a lot of stuff in it. It says, and it will be given to him. It will be given to him. Expect it. Anticipate it. Based on the promise of Scripture. You can fully anticipate our Lord granting your request for wisdom. You can anticipate that. You can anticipate it with belief. But when he asks, we must believe. It says that in the sixth verse of James. Anticipate it without, without doubt. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Really, when it comes down to us, what it comes down to is, do you believe that God is a generous, gracious, gentle God? Do you believe that? Amen. 
Yeah, it makes a difference. If you doubt the truth of what God is like, you'll not only lack wisdom, but you'll become a doubter as well. A doubter. And the person who doubts, there are some characteristics of people who doubt. One is, they're unpredictable. It says there in James 1, 6, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. It says that not only are you unpredictable, but you are unblessed as well. That man, it says in James 1, 7, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Hmm. You will be unfocused. I know we have some here with that. You will be unfocused because it calls you there in that first chapter of James. It says a doubter is an unfocused individual. Unfocused. Double-minded man. Unstable, it says in James 8, 1, 8. Unstable in all that he does. If you recognize any of these characteristics from your own life, these are the reasons why. It tells us that you're going to be unpredictable and unblessed and unfocused and unstable. It tells us that. <laughs> it all comes down to this. It all comes down to whether or not I believe in the giving, generous, gracious, gentle God. It is my choice how I believe about him. I will decide, see? So fathers, and I speak to you particularly, do you want a doubter's life? Or do you want the wise man's life that is protected and powerful and prosperous, I personally, I would vote for that one. Personal, protected. It all comes down to faith, all of it. I implore you this morning, you see, to accept the grand description of God. Understand that that's the God that you believe in. That's the God that you are trusting in. That is the God whose admonitions you are following. Admit your need for wisdom. Ask God for it. And based on who God is, anticipate it with all your heart. Expect it. Know that it will happen. Know that it is true because of who God is and what he is like. Otherwise, otherwise, you see, you will find you're living a life that is unpredictable and unblessed and unfocused and unstable in all of your ways. Now, if we were to stop and get really personal, and I would go down the row and I would ask you questions individually, by name, some of you would say to yourself, I'm glad this is the first time I've ever been here. He doesn't know my name. <laughs> and you'd be right. Right? But the fact is that he comes to us and he offers us this kind of life that we can have. Where we can improve on these things that we beat up on ourselves all the time about. Where we say to yourselves, do you ever say to yourself, I don't know what's the matter with me. Why do I do that? unfocused, unstable. You need to admit your need for wisdom. Ask God for it, based on who God is and who you understand him to be. Decide who that is. It's a decision. That's all it is. It is a decision that you decide who God is. And you will decide whether his promises are true. I trust you will do that. I trust you will do that this morning. Let's bow our heads. So, Father, we come to you right now. And there are people here we know very well, and there are people that we do not yet know at all. And, Father, we need wisdom.
we understand the times when we haven't used it and haven't exercised it. So we come to you right now and we ask you to come into our lives and grant us this wisdom. Father, we need more of you and a lot less of us. So come in the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us in the decisions that we have to make even this afternoon and the decisions we must make for tomorrow and the next day and the next week and month and year. Dear Lord, we come to you asking you to give us direction and give us guidance in all of these things. So we would say to you even right now, dear Lord Jesus, come in the power of your Holy Spirit. Change us. Help us, each and every one of us, to know more about you. Take, dear Lord, that empty space that is in our heart that was shaped to possess you and let us open our hearts and accept your presence there. Rejoicing, dear Lord, and happy and fulfilled because you now are Lord of our lives. So we ask you for wisdom. We ask you for direction. And Lord, we thank you for them. We thank you for them all that you will come and do this in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>